Hello, I hope you're well. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today's video is my February wrap up. And I don't know how I pulled this off, but February is the shortest month in the year, obviously, but somehow I managed to finish nine books, which is a particularly good reading month for me. And I don't know if it was because I was motivated by the fact that I was taking part in the Historathon Readathon or because there were some books that I was really, really excited about reading for Black History Month, but whatever the case may be, I read some really fantastic books that I'm excited to talk to you about. So why don't we dive right in? So I'm going to start off with the books that I read for Black History Month. And the first one that I want to talk about is The Street by Anne Petrie, which was a recommendation by one of my subscribers, Marie Luke. And all I have to say is, wow 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 it was amazing it was obviously five stars for me but i would be shocked amazed gobsmacked if this book didn't end up being one of my favorite reads of 2021 it was just that good so the book itself is about this single black mother named Ludi who is trying to raise her son Bub and is also trying to better their lot in life and she moves into an apartment on the street in Harlem during the 1940s and you kind of see that this street has this sort of corruptive um, force to it. And so the book is really about Ludi and the people that she interacts with, most of whom are live in her building, but not exclusively so. And it was just so powerful. I gush about it and go into almost like real time responses and reactions to it in my February vlog. So if you're interested, I would definitely check that out. But this book, the characters were so vivid and I loved the way that you got into their heads and I think in my vlog I called it almost like a stream of consciousness but that's not what it is but you just understand the both internal and external voices of this of these characters so so well and I also love the fact that the city of New York and Harlem in particular are really like their own characters in this book. You have a strong sense of time and place and it's just so beautifully done and I was in awe of it. But really I think what stood out for me is the sort of social commentary that this book provided. And so this is written in the 1940s or 1950s before we we're calling it what it was, which is systemic racism. But the book really talks about kind of the cyclical nature of the racism that oppresses black people during this time period. And it does that through various aspects of these characters. But in particular, when it comes to Ludi and the street, she talks about in detail how black families are at a disadvantage because they can't earn money honestly that will provide for their family with food, housing, all of that stuff, unless both parents work. And even then it's usually not enough to really do much with. And so because of that, both parents do have to leave the home and their children are then raised by the street. And it kind of continues the cycle. It was just so, so powerful. I really really loved it and obviously gave it five stars as I said at the beginning of this but it was so good and I feel like it's an underrated classic that everyone should read ASAP. The next book is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison which was actually my first Toni Morrison book ever. Going into it I knew to expect exceptional writing, I expected like the most poetic prose ever and it really delivered. It was stunning. 
But beyond that, I had no idea what I was in for. The book itself is about this young black girl named Piccola who prays for blue eyes and blonde hair to fit in and so that she'll be considered beautiful. This was so powerful and also so uncomfortable to read and I feel like part of that reason is because you're dealing with really uncomfortable subjects to begin with, like beauty standards, like colorism, but I think because the entire book is told from the vantage point of these small children, um, Claudia, who is the narrator, who is like 10, 11, maybe, and also her sister and Pecola, it's very unsettling to hear an innocent child talking about these subjects and the way in which they view the world, the way in which they talk about the world, is really so innocent. But what they're talking about, the domestic violence they're seeing, the poverty, the racism, all of that, it's hard to see from that vantage point. And it's done so well and so vividly, but it was definitely an uncomfortable book despite how beautiful it was and I think it's meant to be. I don't think this is a book that you're meant to go into and feel like a weight lifting off your shoulder at the end of it. It's a book that's made with the intent of making you think about all of these subjects and kind of reassessing them all. I ended up giving this a four-star review it was really beautiful and I want to read more Toni Morrison for sure, but if all of her books are like this, it it definitely takes a little bit out of you. It's, it's not an easy read, but definitely deserves a read. So next up is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, and I am probably the last person on the planet to read this book, but it was actually chosen as the book for our own voice book club at work, and I'm really glad it was because since I don't read YA, I don't think this is a book that I would have naturally gravitated towards despite how many people love this book. So in case you don't know what the Hate You Give is about. It is about teenager Star who witnesses the murder of her childhood friend Khalil and follows her as she takes an, a stand and becomes the voice for her silenced friend and everything that happens as a result of that. So it's really timely but it's also frustrating in its timeliness based on everything that happened last summer because the book was written in I think 2016 or 2017 and it was timely then and the story was actually the response to something that had happened in 2009 and 2010 so it was timely then as well. So the fact that we still have so much to do in order to prevent this from this sort of thing from happening is frustrating and aggravating and just, I don't even think I have the words for it. All of the characters felt like they were representative of different parts of society. So you have Star, who is the somewhat reluctant activist, because for a time she's worried about what coming forward would mean for her and for her family. You have her friend that I think is a sort of an embodiment of the performative allyship. You have her uncle who is a cop, but he is a foil to the cop that murdered her friend. You have Big Mav, her father, who is this former gangster who makes good and is now trying to help the community. And it's just interesting to see all of these different characters and how they create this community within the book itself. And so I thought that was really, really well done. I ended up giving it four stars, and this was honestly a, a case of it's not you, it's me with the book, because as I've mentioned, I don't read a lot of YA, and so I don't necessarily 
enjoy being inside the head of a teenager. Even when I was a teenager, that did not interest me. So Wildstar was an amazing character. I was oftentimes more drawn to what was happening with Big Mav or her mother or her uncle, sort of the adult in the story, and wanted to know more about them. And again, that's just because I don't read YA and don't usually gravitate towards those stories. So for me it was a four star, but I can honestly understand why everyone loves this book and it is hyped for a reason and should be read. Let's just say that. And the next book is Gingerbread by Helen Oyeyemi. And I'm going to be straight with you. I have no idea what I read here. Like none. So me trying to describe this plot to you is going to be interesting. <laughs> so just bear with me. So from what I gather, the book is about this mother-daughter duo, Harriet and Perdita Lee, and Harriet is from this country that may or may not exist in their world. Like there's a debate over that. And she has this gingerbread recipe that she makes and she basically forces gingerbread onto everyone. And then there is her daughter who is this character that eats so much of the gingerbread at some point that I think she gets sick from it. And then while she's recovering, her mother is telling her about her childhood in life in this country that may or may not exist and about her friendship with this other girl named Gretel who was also obsessed with her gingerbread and then eventually Perdita I think goes in search of this friend Gretel. That's as close to an explanation of this book as I can get. I was a I was listening to the audiobook and for a little bit I was wondering if it was the fact that I was listening to the audiobook that made this as confusing as it was for me, but then I went on Goodreads and actually saw that a lot of people were equally as lost as I was. So I didn't switch over to the print version because it didn't sound like that would make a difference. This is a book that had so much going on. Like it was described as being magical realism, but I feel like there was so much of it that it probably was more fantasy than not. Like there are dolls that talk, like one of those things in this weird country. But there are also like the way time moved, especially when you're learning about Harriet's life in this country that may or may not exist. It just kind of jumps around a lot. It was very hard to kind of follow the plot points and follow what was happening to the characters and it was just weird. It was very very weird and I just couldn't get a grasp of it. I did finish it but I ended up not wanting to give it a review because I don't think I'm the right person for this book and since I honestly did not understand what was going on. It just didn't feel fair to give it a review. So that's that's kind of where I stand on that one. It was bizarre. Like really, really bizarre. And I think the most frustrating part about this book is that I could tell that the writing was beautiful. It was very unique and I liked the writing style. I just could not connect with this story at all, unfortunately. So there you have it. And the last book that I read in honor of Black History Month was Transcendent Kingdom by Yaa Jesse. Now I was so hyped about this book, like so, so hyped. <laughs> I read Homegoing last summer with some colleagues and was floored. It became one of my favorite books of 2020. So going into this, I had very, very high expectations for the book itself. This ended up being very different from Homegoing. 
Homegoing was historical fiction and it was a series of interconnected stories spanning a few hundred years in one particular family and this is really contemporary fiction where the main character Gifty is a PhD candidate at Stanford where she's creating like these cyborg mice as she's studying um, reward seeking behavior and how it pertains to addiction and depression and part of that is because her older brother died from an overdose and her mother suffers with depression. And it was beautifully written, the same as Homegoing. Um, Gifty as a character is really rich and her way of thinking and everything that she experiences is really powerful. And I think as far as the depiction of a family member who is witnessing a loved one suffering with an addiction or dealing with depression, it's really powerful in that way. But I will say that I didn't connect as much with this book as I did with Homegoing. Like Homegoing is a book that I still talk about non-stop and recommend to everyone and I just had like a, vis a visceral connection to that book. This one was a little bit different for me as far as the reading experience goes and I think honestly part of that is because I don't read a ton of contemporary fiction but for me some of this felt very much like the same age-old debate about religion versus science and I don't know that it really added anything new or interesting to that debate which I've read about and heard about and even debated myself many many times because it's a debate that has been going on for hundreds of years so I don't know that in that way it delivered for me but it's still a beautiful book like yeah Jesse yes anytime she publishes something I will buy it and read it because she is just a phenomenal writer so there you have it on that one um, I gave it four stars in case I did not say that because I don't remember if I did or not so there you have it moving right along to the other books that I read this month I want to talk about Sanin by Mikhail Artsebyshev and this is a Russian classic and also a reread for me I'm going to be upfront and say that this is not a book for everyone. I read this for a Russian intelligentsia seminar back in the day and really enjoyed it then and wrote an obscene number of papers on it so I did want to reread it but I think this is a book that unless you have an interest in Russian literature or Russian history it's probably going to be a pass and the reason I say that is because whereas other Russian classics like War and Peace or Anna Karenina are stories that potentially have a message or a commentary on something, this feels more so like a political tract or a message that just happens to be packaged in the form of a story. So it is a lot of commentary on politics and religion and the revolution and all of that during the time in which it was written and just to kind of give a really brief plot synopsis the focus is on these young Russian revolutionaries who really spend their time going to meetings where they're talking about politics and religion and things like that and the meaning of life kind of very lofty ambitions but they're also kind of obsessed with boning each other yeah it's it's weird um there is a lot of talk of death in this book it's also just as a trigger warning there are like three suicides in this book um but it does also talk about sexuality and female sexuality and Sanin as an antihero is like chef's kiss but again I do feel like this is a book that would be hard to appreciate for what it is without having a little bit of background 
But as far as a Russian classic goes, I do think that the size of it makes it more accessible and it's also written in a more modern style than like a Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or any of those individuals. So I ended up giving this four stars because I did enjoy it, but as I said, probably not a book for everyone. Moving right along to books that might actually interest people, I'm going to talk about the books that I read for the Historathon Readathon, and the first of those books is Inheritors by Asako Scheherazawa, and to be honest, this book more aligned with, I think, my subconscious expectations for Transcendent Kingdom. Like, this gave me homegoing vibes. It's written in a similar style in that it is also a series of interconnected stories about several generations of a family. In this case though, it happens to be about a Japanese family, so it's looking at Imperial Japan, World War II, post-World War II, and then even some Japanese Americans living in in the United States, obviously. So I spoke about this pretty extensively in that same February vlog, but I really enjoyed this book. I thought the characters were arresting, I thought the writing was beautiful, and I just appreciated the fact that it made me think so much more about how the war impacted Japan than I had previously thought about it, and really opened my eyes to a lot of things when it comes to both World War II in the Pacific and post-World War II in the Pacific as well. So it was just really interesting from the perspective of someone who reads a lot of historical fiction but doesn't necessarily read a ton of historical fiction set in this part of the world in Asia. That being said, I did give it four stars because while it was absolutely stunning, it could be a little confusing as to how all the pieces kind of fit together because unlike Homegoing, which kind of moved chronologically, this did not. And in fact, if it hadn't been for the like chart at the front of the book that had the family tree but then also told you who was in what story and around what time period that story took place, I probably would have been quite a bit lost. I referred to that thing constantly. So for ease of reading, I would say that it wasn't the easiest, but it was certainly beautiful. So in addition to that too, the end of the book kind of takes a look at the future and sort of the existential threats that we are dealing with right now. And while it was interesting, it gets a little speculative for me, and usually when things get speculative, I run the other way. So <laughs> it just was something that did not vibe or gel with me at the very end. I would definitely recommend this book regardless though. It was beautifully written and a beautiful work of historical fiction. And especially if you really enjoyed Homegoing, I could see you potentially really enjoying this as well. So those are my thoughts on this. Again, this was four stars. So the next book that I want to talk about is The Witches of St. Petersburg by Imogen Edwards Jones. And I really enjoyed this book. Like this was just so fun. <laughs> I think the closest thing I could compare it to is maybe Bridgerton meets the Romanovs. So in this book you are following two sisters, Melitza and Stana, who are the daughters of the Montenegrin king, and they marry into the Romanov court and befriend and become the confidants of Tsarina Alexandra, who is Anastasia's mother, and they are very involved in her life as far as trying to help her to produce a male heir and also 
because of those efforts are the ones that introduce her to Rasputin and I think what ends up kind of drawing them together the this trio of women is the fact that they are all to a degree outsiders. Tsarina Alexandra is a granddaughter of Queen Victoria and the Russians don't necessarily like her all that much and Melitza and Stana are kind of looked down upon by the rest of the Romanov court and are outsiders because they are practitioners of black magic and all of that sort of thing. So when I say that this book kind of reminds me of Bridgerton, it's very much about sort of courtly life with the lavish parties and the scandal and the sex and all of that. And like in Bridgerton, a lot of this book actually takes place at these really extravagant balls and events of that nature, which admittedly I could see some people saying it gets a little repetitive, but this is where these people come together and gossip. So understandably so. So it has that feel to it. Um, it also has a lot of the occult going on, tarot card runes, spells, all sorts of witchy type of things, and it does really lean hard into the sort of myth and legends that surround Rasputin and all of the sort of strange things that he, that he reportedly did. Um, so it really leans hard into that. But the book itself was just really, really a fun romp. You kind of get to see the extravagance of the Romanov court during those twilight years, kind of leading up to the revolution. And so you hear the revolutionary kind of stirring underneath the surface. You're, you're seeing the Tsar's family concerned about whether or not they can produce a male heir and then trying to hide Alexei, the heirs malady from everyone. You see the impact of different assassinations within the family and just all of these different elements of history are kind of woven together, which I really enjoyed. But I liked the fact that you are looking at these two historical figures who were known as the Black Peril and kind of weaves in all of this history and then adds this sort of fantastical element without really going too fantasy-like, if that makes sense. But I really enjoyed it. Was it a perfect book? No. I noticed kind of sloppy things with the patronymic names getting mixed up, which bugged me, but in the grand scheme of things, most people don't pay attention to that sort of information. Um, I would say that if you're not cool with kind of the witchy occulty things, probably stay away from this. And also just know that it can get a little smutty and weird with some of the sex scenes. So also keep that in mind. But as far as just being really scandalous, really fun, I devoured this. So I did end up giving it four stars. And lastly, we have Outlander by Diana Gabaldon, which was again another reread for me and part of one of my 2021 reading goals is to actually read the entire series. But I first read book one, I want to say in 2013 or 2014, just before the series premiered, whenever that was. And I really love this book. It's one of my favorite books of all time. I stan Jamie and Claire. But I do know that this is a sort of divisive book. There are people that stand the series, both in book form and on TV, but then there are people who really, really hate it and think it's absolute trash. So before I even started reading this, I decided to like take a look at the less favorable reviews on Goodreads to see how that might inform my reread of it. I still enjoy it. So for anyone who doesn't know what this book is about, it is about Claire, who is a former frontline nurse from World War II, who goes with her husband 
on a honeymoon in the Scottish Highlands when she's unwittingly transported to the 18th century. And while there, she ends up having to marry a Scottish Highlander, Jamie, to protect herself. So it is historical fiction, but it does have this fantastical element of time travel to it. Now, I think that this book is so well researched and really the Highlands in Scotland in this book are a character in and of themselves. This is part of why I ended up going to Scotland in 2016 after reading this book because it was like an HD almost reach out and touch it type of feel with this book and the Highlands like Inverness and that sort of thing. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it, but I also really like the character of Claire and the relationship between Claire and Jamie is just like amazing. I, if I have a fictional crush, it would definitely be Jamie, like he's my man. Back off Claire. Although I am gushing about the book, I do think that some of the criticism that it has received is valid. So one of the main ones is the violence in the book, which there is a lot of it. I won't deny it from dislocated shoulders to sword fights and gunplay to sexual violence to torture. It's kind of all in there. So if any of that is triggering for you, this is probably not the book for you. I didn't personally find it gratuitous because the book is covering about a year in time. So it's not as if all of that is happening in like the span of a few weeks. It is a literal year. And as far as the sexual violence, I think most people know about the male rape scene in this book at this point. And it is really uncomfortable to read. It is really painful to read. But I still am of the opinion that it was a brave choice to make. I think when you take into account that even today so many men who are rape survivors don't report because they're afraid of how it reflects on them, that it somehow emasculates them, that having your male hero be a survivor of sexual violence is is something like I don't know what that something is but it is definitely something and also I will just say there are certain sexual encounters in this book that as a 21st century woman definitely make me a little cringy But I also try to remember that this book was written about 30 years ago. So even in that time period, how we view certain things has changed. And so I always try to look at the book based on the time period that it was written in. And I don't use that as an excuse, but it's always a lens that I try to approach the books that I'm reading through. So there is that. There are certainly scenes that make me cringy and uncomfortable as a 21st century woman in a post Me Too world. So there is that. And then one of the other critiques that I saw a lot was the relationship between Claire and her two husbands. So the one that's in 1945 or 1946 and then Jamie in the 18th century. I don't think the book sets it up for Claire and her husband Frank from her present 1945 to actually be in a marriage that is necessarily on good footing. Um, they spent the better part of six years apart. I think it says that they met up like three times during the war. But even if you kind of look at what's going on during the honeymoon, like he, ac he accuses her of potentially having affairs while they were separated during the war. She contemplates whether or not he had affairs later on. Um, they don't see 
like eye to eye on whether or not they should consider adoption and she's also just bored by everything that Frank is really excited and passionate about so I don't think she's as in love with Frank as anyone thinks because I really honestly feel that Frank is put on this pedestal in a way because he's representative of everything that she's left behind and for a lot of this book she is trying to get back to her own time so he's more of a personification of what she's left behind than actually a love interest whereas Jamie in my opinion is the person that she's meant to be with forever so I feel like I've gone on and on about this book so I'm going to stop now but I do really love this book I think it's really well researched historical fiction I think it's about a time period that I knew next to nothing about before reading this book and have since become increasingly more interested in and I'm very excited to continue on with the series and get through it by the end of 2021. So this was a five star read for me if I gave star ratings to books that I've reread. So that's a wrap. Those are the nine books that I finished reading in February and as I said there were a number of really amazing ones here. I think most of these books were four or five star ratings, so I highly recommend them. If you have read any of them, certainly let me know what your thoughts were because I would love to hear it. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. And if you enjoyed it, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, comment and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Bye.